Thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Yeah, uh, the film premiered last night, yeah. is that right? Yeah. How, how, how was it for you? How did it go for you? I think it went really well, yeah. 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 So, Casey, what we're gonna do, a lot of your work is also deals with memory yes. and uh, history and memory. So, in that regard, we're gonna go backwards through your okay. earth, and we're gonna start with Harriet. Um, so what we'll do, let's talk a little bit about it first. It's been a long awaited project. Yes. It's been something that audiences have been waiting for for a long time. Yeah. It's been kind of floating around uh, Hollywood for a while. Uh, there's, I read an interview where you said you have to be in love with a project yeah. to do it. Tell us a bit about how this project grabbed you and how you came to it. Uh, I went in for a general meeting with the producer. Um, so I was, I was tricked into taking a meeting. Um, that I didn't, I didn't know what the meeting was about, and partway into the meeting, um, she said, you know, I'm involved in the Harriet Tubman project. I said, oh, that's right. And uh, we started talking about it, and uh, um, the way she was talking, I thought she was asking me to rewrite the script, uh, which she was. So I said, well, yeah, that's interesting, um, but, you know, it'd be much more interesting if I was directing it. And she said, that's what we're talking about. And all of a sudden, my heart started pounding. <laughs> and, you know, my blood pressure went up. And um, Was this something that you'd been tracking and going, I'd love to? Not really. No, no huh? not at all. I, I knew that there were various projects that were, um, had been in the works for years mm. of, uh, dealing with Harriet Tubman. Mm. Um, no, it kind of um, was in some ways the perfect way to get me in a room and spring it on me. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of the perfect way because I had to take my own temperature. Like I had to, I had to analyze my um, physiological reaction. Mm -hmm. And when I saw mm -hmm. that it was um, fear and excitement, mm. uh, and and just how um, how fast my heart was beating. Mm. That's when I realized, I said, okay, this is, you're excited. Right. <laughs> you know, this is tremendous. And is that often how you work? You take the temperature in the, in the moment that way? Yeah, something? usually it happens very slowly. Okay. So um, usually it happens like, you know, I'm, I'm aware of something and then I just, I find myself, you know, somebody will talk to me about a project and then I'll like, I'll find myself just Googling stuff or I'll buy a book. Right. And yeah. then I'm like I'm dreaming about it and right. then I'm like looking up that thing again. <laughs> right. And then um you know, I might, you know, read something and then one day I always describe it like uh, you know, you might work with a coworker or something. And you're like, Oh, you know, nice person, I like this person and then one day you can't breathe. That's the way it's like for me. <laughs> right. One day it's like I can't right. live they are without gorgeous. this. Yeah. 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 It's like falling in love, exactly like falling in love. All right. Interesting. So um, we're going to show a clip from uh, the film. So it, it's going to show the trailer of the film, so there's no spoilers in it. Um, and we're going to talk about the interesting casting of this mm -hmm. film afterwards as well. So if you'd like to show the first clip, please. I get, I get, I, I've seen the film, so I get real chills. I mean, uh, interestingly, I get, more, I get more chills now I've seen the film. Mm -hmm. I saw the trip, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Right. <laughs> so. Okay, let's talk about Cynthia Revo. I, I can't remember a leading lady like her in, in, in my living memories, Naturalist. Could tell us about, you've worked with some of the finest black actors of our generation. Yeah. Tell us about working with Cynthia. This was a perfect actor-director relationship. Um, wow, where can I start? So I met Cynthia, so Cynthia had been, had, they were talking to Cynthia, so Cynthia had been involved with the project before I was approached. Mm. My first meeting with her, I'd, I had done research on, on Harriet, and so she, she was beginning to be very concrete to me, like a very, you know, like she was sitting next to me. I started to have a real sense of her. And then I met Cynthia, who's very um, glamorous, you know, and mm. beautiful. But she, there was so much about her that was Harriet you know, her physical stature, uh, which became important to me in um, the research, you know, uh, which is something that in portraying um, a person like this, another director might not think was important, but to me that she was so tiny mm. uh, was, was kind of and it awesome. Was, it's important watching the film yeah. know, to see her outflanked this way and that she has this result. Yeah, yeah. she's, she's, um, she's very small and very uh, strong and, um, yeah. and very fast and uh, very awesome, yeah. at, like Harriet, you yeah. know. And so when I saw her, um, we instantly started the way that she would talk, the way that we were talking about it together, 
I could tell, okay, this is, I think this is going to work. But I, honestly, I still had a lot of um, uncertainty. And there were things that I wouldn't know until we started digging deep into it. Mm -hmm. um, not uncertainty because of anything other than this person has to pull off this whole movie. You right. know? It's like, right. if, I don't, if I don't get this performance, right. um, I don't have a movie. Yes. And so she better be incredible. Yes. Um, and then as we started working on it, the way that we would talk about it, I could just tell. Yeah. You know, the way that we, the way that we could discuss it together and just, you know, like, we talk about looking at her face and looking at her mouth and um, really kind of channeling her, feeling her. Yeah. And she talked about her voice and where her voice was going to sit and, and the way I could tell her approach to it. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't really until the, the first day. The first day I lost all concern. Wow. She came to set wow. as Harry, and I was like, okay, there, there she is. Yeah, she, she certainly is there. The other thing that you evoke in, in this film that, you, that has cropped up in many of your films, mm. and definitely in your first film, is her relationship between spirituality, mm. her relationship mm. between God, and particularly the, the relationship between black women and yeah. God and spirituality, mm. which mm. I've, again, rarely seen portrayed in any of the filmmakers' work, and which is what draws me to yours. Can you tell us a bit about why you, you bring that forward in your work? Yeah, I mean, it's a big part of my life um, in a way that, uh, that is not necessarily apparent, mm. uh, because I'm not, I'm not particularly religious. Mm. Uh, but it, it's a personal conversation, you know, and, um, and it's like I kind of believe in everything. I'm just one of those people, you know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. so w I grew up that way. I grew up, um, Eve's Bayou, like uh, my first film, a lot of it is, uh, is, is completely made up, but the kind of most extraordinary parts of it were based on my family, you know. Yeah. Like I had an aunt that was a, a psychic counselor and um, yeah. she married five times and, you know, her yeah. lover killed her second husband and she was a very colorful character. And um, so I grew up in a very kind of colorful Southern family and, um, and that's the way we would, you know, talk. And that's yeah. the way my, uh, certainly my aunts would, you know, yeah. I had a vision, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's something in, there's a real truth mm -hmm. in that in terms of, you know, sort of the intimacy I was speaking of that you, you're able to bring forth about African American and black yeah. communities yeah. that often isn't spoken about. Mm -hmm. And that relationship between spirituality is very apparent, I think, mm -hmm. in many of our lives, which is why I think it might, it, it, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about who you're speaking to when you're making your films, but there feels like a very direct conversation happening. To, mm -hmm. I think to black audiences, personally, I feel like that. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. The other thing I think is extraordinary about Harriet is, yes, of course she's a hero, she's amazing. Cynthia's perfect, Harriet's amazing. Mm -hmm. But to me, when I walked away, I thought, why has this film touched me so much? It's because actually the hero of the film is the whole community mm -hmm. and it's because she loves them so much. Mm -hmm. She does this act out of love. And I was saying to you earlier that watching all of your films, that's what I'd realized. Each of your characters are motivated by love, which often isn't the case in lots of black dramatic storytelling. Mm -hmm. It's often trauma. Is that something you're conscious of? Or I can't say that I was conscious of it until you <laughs> mentioned it. Um, but I love love stories. I do kind of look at um, even things that might not be necessarily apparent um, as a love story. Mm -hmm. uh, like talk to me, you know. Yes. Like it's a well, it's a love story. It's like it's like you know two guys, and um, but they, and it's platonic, but it's a love story, um, the way the great friendships love stories. And um, but no, I, I didn't really think about it. You mm -hmm. know, people ask me a lot, what do I think is unifying in in my movies, and um, mm -hmm. I never I never quite have an answer. But now I do. You so. got it. <laughs> it's black love. It's black love. You do it very well. Okay, so we're gonna we just to, just to prove the point, mm -hmm. we're gonna skip on to your next another film. So working backwards, so Black Nativity. Okay. Um, it's interesting. The BFI are about to launch its musical season. All right. Um, and when I was working here, I was like, why haven't they been more black musicals? Mm -hmm. Given the fact that we are, you know, there's a song and dance, right, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. strain, mm -hmm. and the visual aesthetic. Well, you went there mm -hmm. with this one. So let's show a clip from Black Nativity, then we'll get into it. <laughs> I, I mean, taking on a musical is, is a, it's a thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a whole nother component, mm -hmm. which is not just telling the story. And this was a stage play mm -hmm. first, wasn't it? Tell us about why you wanted to bring it to the screen. I get approached by a producer <laughs> right. um, who right. said, um, would you ever do a movie version of Black Nativity? And I was like, 
Yeah. Was it, was it a famous <laughs> play? Was it, was, it, was it a fairly famous it, play? It was, yeah, it's a, it's a famous play. Uh, Langston Hughes wrote it. It's very um, slender, so it's very open to interpretation. Right. And my mother took me every year when I was a kid. Boston was a major venue for it, and so once we moved to Boston at Christmas time, you know, people would do churches and, and um, theater groups would do black nativity, and so um, my mother took me to see it every year. And um, but it's very very slender. Uh, right. It's really just spectacle, okay. and so I had to kind of write a context for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Also, what I thought was interesting, um, again watching all of your films, is there is a theatricality mm -hmm. to your to your work. You often use dancers mm -hmm. and movement mm -hmm. um, artists in your work. Is that something that you're again? Uh, something that you're conscious of that you that excites you or something about crossing those mediums? Um, I guess it does. I, I don't. Um, I haven't analyzed it. You know, like mm. I, I, I was a dancer. I danced for a while. Mm. Um, I love uh, theater, but I haven't really, you know, I haven't really thought about it. Certainly, with this, there was a theatricality that I thought was ne you know was necessary. Yes, mm -hmm. and again, you've got. All star cast: Forrest Whitaker, Angela Bassett, Jennifer Hudson. So, I mean, it goes on and goes on. Uh, people like to work with you. Yes. It seems. Yes. Um, why is that? How, how how do you go about doing your casting? And and you know what, what's what what do you think? The why is it easy for you to get these amazing people for your films? I think um, having worked with a lot of with black cast a lot, you know, um, and just being one of those directors. Um, you know, at this point, um, yeah, people are, every time <laughs> I meet with an actor, they're, they're, like, they're like, you're going through your phase where you're working with me now, <laughs> you know, they're trying to hypnotize me. Into, um, but uh, no, I think that um, I've been very, 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 very lucky. Hmm. Do you think, you obviously started as an actor, mm -hmm. I mean, a long, I mean, you did, you know, racked up lots of credits. Is that, in terms of the elements of directing that you like, is that the part that you like the most? This is a very leading question, but in terms of working directly with the actors, mm. is that, a, um, do you think that's something that you One something? would think the answer would be yes, mm. but no, it's equally, every aspect of it is important. That's probably my favorite, yeah. but, um, but I love uh, all of it. I love mise-en-scene. I love like uh, what frames look like and emotional, uh, emotional photography and yeah. um, how to tell a story visually. Yeah. And how to move through? Um, I, I mean, I love screenwriting, and I love uh, how to move, how to put it on a page, and how to get it from the page to the screen. And yeah. I love everything about it. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I love working with actors. Yeah. So, talking of uh, Stella Cass, let's come to talk to me next. Yeah. Um, I'd really, really, if those of you who haven't seen it, another a great um, slice of history. Mm -hmm. um, a, a true, based on a true story, mm -hmm. true characters character called um, Petey Green, who's an ex-con mm -hmm. DJ, mm -hmm. and how he meets Dewey Hughes, who's a radio producer, just at the kind of turning point in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. We'll talk a bit about it. We'll roll the clip. Um, and also, sorry, to Raji P. We need to talk. OK, let's we'll do, yeah. roll the clip <laughs> and then we'll have a conversation. <laughs> right. <laughs> Honestly, I rewound that scene about three times. It is so delightful. OK. So first of all, why hasn't Taraji P got an Oscar? Five. She's just amazing. I think there's something, though, what I love about that is it shows the, uh, the tone, the pace, mm -hmm. the energy of this film, but also what a great ensemble cast can do. Yeah. You know, I think it's, it is true, Atel, it is Don, but without Taraji, this film wouldn't have that kind of energy and that bite. So tell us a bit about coming to this film. It's such a specific story. I'd never heard of right. Peter Green. It's fascinating. So tell us a bit about how this came about. I think um, in some ways my, um, my kind of sneaky superpower and why I've been able to work for so long is, um, is being a writer. So they yes. approached me to, um, to help with the script. The, the script was already quite good, um, but they wanted to work on the female character. And so uh, this was the one where, as I'm rewriting the script, you know, and I started playing Sly and the Family Stone and kind of... <laughs> Right. You know, working on it, and then one day I couldn't breathe, and I called Mage, and I was like, I, have, I think I've got a direct talk to me, you know, and he's like, you're nowhere on their list. You're like, no, I mean, they're not even thinking that. They're going out to Clint Eastwood, you know, and I'm like, okay, maybe you'll pass, and um, and so I, I had to basically wait for uh, every director to 
to um, pass on the project. I can't imagine who else could have done that. Yeah, I can't imagine. Um, and again, get like what you said before, this is very much about love between two people. Mm -hmm. This time these two men, mm -hmm. this filial love, and then also love of this community. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting how love plays out through this film. Mm -hmm. Why, where, where Peter Green is, um, how far he's prepared to go mm -hmm. and how far he's not, when he's mm -hmm. beginning to leave his community. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very interesting. But okay, tell me about um, Vanel. Is that her character? Brunel, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm re I wanted to talk to you about this also. So it's interesting you came on to rewrite her. Um, and again, I think this is what you do for black women characters particularly. It would be very easy to typecast mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. um, she's the tart with the heart, mm -hmm. effectively. Mm -hmm. Ex, uh, you know, go-go mm -hmm. dancer, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But it's proper couple goals. Mm -hmm. I mean, the love between these two are, and the way that she's allowed to be her full self. So tell us a bit about how you approached writing. Okay, so first of all, this was a very good script, and she was already a very interesting character. Um, I guess I, I, um, I tried to put her feet on the ground. Mm. And that's uh, working with Taraji as well, you know, because Taraji can swing from the chandeliers, and it's like, okay, you know, um, she's a real woman, you know. So we want to be this outrageous. Um, uh, people, Dewey's reaction to Vernell is the audience's re reaction in some ways, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where he eventually kicks her out. He, he was, won't allow her in the radio station for a while. Mm -hmm. um, you want to, I wanted to take the audience to the edge of what they could stand, you know, right. whilst, and then realize how much you're in love with her. Yes, you and know? she is the one that brings up love mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. way, doesn't she? She's the one that says, you know that you love him, mm -hmm. you know, and it's really interesting that, that she is the one who kind of counts up. But yeah, it's it's a wonderful uh, interplay between these these wonder, amazing actors. It's um, you know the the part about directing that's interesting is um, assuring because I remember, you know, it was a scary role for her, and um, you know she's totally game like Taraji's <laughs> game, but. Um, the interesting thing about directing is um, assuring actors that you have their performance in your, you know, I can remember saying to Taraji, I've got it in the palm of my hand, like I've got you, like I've right. got, like I know we're going to do this together and it's not going to be foolish, it's going to be beautiful, right. but it's got to be a little foolish in right. order <laughs> to be beautiful. <laughs> right. So there's that trust, yeah. there's a kind of trust uh, relationship that's going on between you and you and the actors. All the time. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to talk. Come to your another film, the earlier film to that, which mm -hmm. is called. Interesting, it's two titles. We yeah. both got confused on this, didn't we? We think the UK title is Sign of the Times, mm -hmm. but it was made as Caveman's Valentine, and there's a different kind of sensitivity mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, in a way, it's a very brave, um, a brave film and a brave depiction of a character. So this is a character where. Samuel L. Jackson plays a character called Romulus. Mm -hmm. He lives Romulus. in a cave. Mm -hmm. He's schizophrenic. And he's turned sleuth in order really to reach out to his daughter, who's a cop. So we're going to show the clip, a clip now. In this clip, you're going to see that he's also a lapsed concert pianist mm -hmm. as well, which is important to know for mm -hmm. the clip. So here, all I say is, here he asks a rich man he's met for a suit. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you roll the clip. <laughs> Very, very particular story, this. Tell, tell me about, tell us about how this came to be. Came to uh, well, project. I have to go back to Eve's Bayou. So I, my first film I made was Samuel Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, when I finished Eve's Bayou, I really didn't, I didn't know that I had to do it again, mm. honestly. It was mm. like, I was like, I drop a mic, I'm done. Right, <laughs> like, that's about uh, to say. Casey yeah, Lemons out, you know, like I'm going to rest on this laurel for like ever, you know. Um, right. But, uh, but Sam called me mm -hmm. and said, uh, you know, we've got this book, The Cayman's Valentine, and um, do you want to direct it? So he, he, so he, he, he approached he, me he approached again. Project. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. interesting. And it's, it's his brave because what I think is quite interesting about this film is that this is a man who clearly has mental health issues, mm -hmm. but actually this is not about, he is the hero of the film. Mm -hmm. And he, 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 it's not about him being cured throughout this film. Mm -hmm. It's about people accepting him mm -hmm. for who he is throughout mm -hmm. this film. That's what's kind of really brave about it. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I think is interesting about this film is how you depict uh, the, the times he has the kind of mental health mm -hmm. um, 
uh, crisis moments. And again, this use of dancers and the moss. So can you speak a bit about your choice of how you chose to visualize those episodes? Uh, well, in the book, you know, he has um, that he's haunted by the Chrysler building and their X-rays and Z-rays. Um, he's he's that he sees is evil, and so I had to I had to visualize all those things. And then he he has these kind of moth seraphs um, dancing around in his brain. Joy, George Dawes Green uh, wrote the book, and uh, you know it's quite wonderfully described. But you never quite know what the moth seraphs they're like angels of destruction, you know. Mm -hmm in his brain, so I decided that these were black men um, dancers, and, mm. uh, you know, that yeah. was fun. Yeah, yeah, it's really, um, y again, watching all your films, you see that that kind of character, that mm -hmm. black male dancer mm -hmm. character crop up a mm -hmm. few times, so it's kind of great to see them en masse <laughs> <laughs> in this film. Um, now, there's a line in this film that I've got to ask you about, mm -hmm. which made me laugh out loud, but also comes to a question around, when you are thinking of audience, if you are ever thinking of audience, do you have an audience in mind? Mm -hmm. So the, the scene, I don't know if you remember this, but the scene is where at one point he ends up sleeping with a white woman mm -hmm. character in the yeah. film. Um, he's also being haunted, as we see, by his ex-wife, mm -hmm. who's a figment of his imagination. So this quite surprising scene where they, he's, they're sort of, they sort of seduce each other and they sleep together. And then he's sort of waking up post-coital, and the ex-wife is there saying, white women will sleep with anybody. <laughs> and I had that reaction. <laughs> no, where I kind I of, because you're watching the scene, and you're like, really? <laughs> and then that happens, and you burst out laughing. And I thought, that, that, so I'm thinking of moments like mm -hmm. that. Are you, are, are there ways in, uh, I think there's a very direct address, mm -hmm. I think, particularly pos possibly to black women mm -hmm. at that moment. I think there's a, there's a layer of understanding that mm -hmm. we may bring to That's that line. That's interesting. Oh no! I think it was it was Sheila's character. Right. So I was thinking, what would she? What does Sheila think? You know, right. like what's his? What does right. he think? His in his imagination, what's his ex-wife say? Right. Right. You know right, what I mean? Right. right. And so it's really like from her, from yes. his. Uh, he, what's what's he hearing? What's the yes. other voice? Yes. That he's hearing. Yes. It's a killer line. It's a great line. And it does, it is a kind of, it's a very intense moment and it's a great... Uh, I do believe I wrote that line though. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, think, I think you did, yeah. I yeah. Think I did. <laughs> um, okay, so now we're going to come to the mic drop film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Eve's Bayou. Uh, how many people have seen... Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. For those, for those of you who haven't, what I'm going to do is play a very long clip because... Um, this film is is now a bona fide modern classic. Um, it's been uh, I don't know what this I, I, this is a big deal in America, but it's now part of the Library of Congress. Yeah, it's been inducted into the National Film Registry, the Library of Congress. Right. <laughs> Thank you. And so, so what I, what I decided to do is I wanted to play the first six minutes of the film. You'll understand why this is a masterclass. Um, I've never seen a film that, this is a complex film. It's a very complex film. It's, it's an ensemble cast. It's set in a very particular time in a very particular community. And I've never seen a film that so perfectly sets up uh, in a very short period of time what's to come. So we're going to roll the first six minutes. And then, so sit back and enjoy. And we'll talk about that. This was your first film. It's, it's incomprehensible to think about this as a first film. It is so perfectly rendered and watching it 20 years later as I did this week it's faultless um, it's set in the southern gothic um, tradition mm -hmm. it's a perfect um, manifestation of that also T and you wrote this as well mm -hmm. so uh, the writing of it is what I think is quite incredible so tell us about coming to this story how did it originate in the writing journey I guess it originated in a very interesting way um, I went in for um, an audition for a TV show, and I knew the casting director, and he said, um, yeah, don't read the lines, just tell me a story, maybe about your family. And um, I, I really wanted the job, you know, so, so I'm like, what's an interesting story about my family? So I started talking about my aunt and how she was a psychic counselor, and she, um, you know, married five times, and, um, and uh, I left there, and I was, I, I went home and I wrote down a story about my aunt. Mm. And then I wrote a story about two kids um, who go into uh, their 
a sick relative's room in the house that lives upstairs in the house and um, very impressionistic. And um, I think I wrote a story about, um, that was based on my mother and aunt going to a fortune teller. Mm. And uh, I started writing these, and I wrote the story of the original even Jean Paul Baptiste. Mm. Okay, yes. And then, I, and then I kind of brought Louis Baptiste for these characters to revolve around. Right. Um, and and the, it kind of became the first literary experiment because um, I was really trying to write prose in a way that was poetic um, and definitely based on Southern literature, which I was a huge fan of um, yeah. Toni Morrison and, um, yeah. and Tennessee Williams and, um, yeah. and also really informed by Gabriel Garcia Marquez and magic realism and all those things that, that um, I loved. And I was trying to write a certain type of way that um, the black people where I was from, the women talked to children. That was very harsh, but was um, wonderful, mm. you know? Mm. Um, play games with me, I swear I'll slap you blind, like that kind of thing, <laughs> you know? And, and, to, and that language, that it was like poetry to me. Yes. You know, it was very beautiful to me. Yes. Um, and, and also, uh, there, was, there was a glamour, mm. you know, to, to my parents and my family. Um, that I wanted to capture because I, I didn't see it much, you know, in mm -hmm. films at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they were very, like, they were like movie stars, you know, they were very beautiful and their friends were beautiful and they had these uh, fabulous parties, you know. And so it was all those things. But it was almost a literary exper experiment yes. at first. So it feels that way. Mm -hmm. It feels like an, an adaptation mm -hmm. because the every, like I said, there's many characters <laughs> in this film, but every single one of them are completely realized. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I think, you know, really huge kudos in terms of being able to write that in quite a compact hour and a half mm -hmm. to take you in, in, into that deep. I think that the reason why this also struck a chord with many of us is because there is so many expressions of black womanhood mm -hmm. and girlhood in this film. Um, and again, so th each of them are 360 crafted. Um, that uh, in one film, I think you've probably been able to quadruple the depictions of black women <laughs> up to that point, mm -hmm. you know, just in this one movie. And was that something that was important for you at the time as well, in the telling of the story? It was, but it wasn't what I was thinking. You know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, it became a movement to me. Mm. But it, you know, I didn't, I wasn't aware of it when I first started. I was writing roles that I might want to play one day, honestly. Okay. So I was writing, yeah. um, I mean, when I first wrote it, I was like, what's the perfect role that I would want to play? Right. And I wrote Moselle, and Moselle was kind of like, you know, my Blanche Dubois, like, you know, like, yes. what's, what's my Blanche Dubois character? And it's Moselle, yep. kind of based on my aunt, and, um, and, and Roz is kind of based on my mother, yep. and, um, and Eve is kind of based on me, and kind of based on Scout and To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, yes. it's very... Um, yeah. And Cicely's kind of based on my sister, you know, and so it, it was, uh, it was like my family, but it wasn't. Yes. Um, yeah. And then it became a movement as I, as the more I talked about it and the more I, um, it became a movement in a lot of ways for me. Mm. Um, it became a very militant film for me. Mm. But it gradually became that as I kind of discussed it and at the pushback against it. As you were making it, it became... As I was, I was, I was making it, it became militant. Yeah. Interesting. It became, I realized it was militant, put it that way. Because the pushback was... Uh, black people don't act like this, black people don't dress like this, you know. <laughs> Interesting. I'm like, really, well, and so, just because you don't know. And so the, t tell me about, mm -hmm. so there's pushback on making this film. Mm -hmm. Again, this is an all black cast? Yeah, so that became very Too militant. Much. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was always an all-black cast. Yeah. But the more people wanted me to put white characters in it, yeah. um, to make it more palatable, and, and and people were like offended that that nobody was talking about white people. Right. Right. You know, and I'm like, right. no, you black people don't spend all their time talking right. about white people. Right. I'm sorry to break it to you. We just live right. life and you know have our own problems and. Right. Um, and so that became, so by the time we made the film, there are no white extras in Eve's Bayou. Yes, there's no, there's no I was thinking, yeah. there's nothing, yeah. Yeah, so, um, but 
I was, uh, you know, at that point in my life, especially um, to now, I mean, it really informed kind of, you know, yeah. who I am. Uh, the more pushback I got, the more I was. Um, yes. And pretty much since determined. then, most of your films don't have many. I mean, there are kind of, I love the fact that Martin, um, Martin Sheen gets a little, little look in, a I little like side Martin order Sheen. and talk, mm. but, but there's not, there's not many other. Um, I mean, I th yeah, I think there is, there is so much that is remarkable about this. And of course, you have got the cast of all casts. Mm -hmm. There is, I mean, and the late, great mm -hmm. Diane Carroll plays mm -hmm. a phenomenal role. So this is your first film. Mm -hmm. You're going out to cast this. Mm -hmm. How easy was it then? I mean, well, yeah. uh, I did something that, I, that uh, um, you know, I was very lucky in my choices um, that I decided to direct the film after trying to, after shopping it for a while as a writer and not being able to attach a director. Um, so I get a lot of work by, you know, directors not wanting to do <laughs> my, my scripts. Um, and I made a short film uh, as kind of like a pot, like a little taste of that I can actually direct um, called Dr. Hugo. And Dr. Hugo is a little piece of Eve's by you almost where a doctor, a handsome doctor pays a house call to a married lady. Right. And, um, and I have Bondi, my husband, play the role. Mm. And um, he, he was my boyfriend at the time. Oh. And um, Sam saw it. And Sam was a character, Samuel L. Jackson was um, very much a character actor at the time. I think he'd just done Pulp Fiction. Right. And he kind of wanted to be a leading man, you know? And so, mm. so with the script, the script was very, um, the script was a thing. Like I took 100 meetings on that script. Yes. Um, and nobody had ever seen anything kind of like that. You know, they're like, who is this person? Yeah. And I got called in to, um, to meet a lot of people who didn't want to make the movie but wanted to meet me. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, Sam read the script and saw my short film. And he wanted to play the sexy doctor. I mean, it was really like yeah. that. It was, it was kind of a stroke of luck. Right. And so he got attached. And then we, um, we had this young girl attached who we uh, loved to play Eve, and she did a bunch of table readings with us, um, and she was great, and she was beautiful. Uh, but the film took so long to make that um, by the time we were ready to make the film, she was a Sicily. Right. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, Megan, you play Sicily, and we gotta find an Eve now. Right. Right. And so, um, and, and she, uh, Eve was the hardest part to cast. Wow, okay. So the rest of the cast had, become to, uh, had come together, and um, Debbie had come in, and in this wonderful audition, and um, and Lynn came on board, and I still didn't have an Eve, you know, mm. and I started to feel like a fraud, you know. I started to I had this film based on this kid that I hadn't found, and and these kids would come in and audition, and they were um, precocious and like horrible, <laughs> and I I um, I was like, no, that's not her at all, you know, that's not her at all, and I was having a hard time articulating what it was. I said, no, I want like an earthy little girl. Mm. You know, mm. I want an mm. earthy, mm. you know, child. Mm. Um, and then one day uh, I was in prep, you know, so I was like fraudulently got all these people down to Louisiana and, you know, I don't have an Eve. And the casting director called me um, and said, I think I found Eve. And so I went back to Los Angeles and Megan was in the room and Sam. They had both come for this audition to audition this girl and Journey came in. And um, as soon as she started, we're like, oh, that's her, you know? Wow. And then um, I walked outside to take a breath, and there's her little brother. And I'm like, do you act? <laughs> <laughs> Two for the price of one. You know, get in there with your sister and like improvise. And so I cast them both. And then later, I cast Diane Carroll. And so wow. Diane Carroll, when I was first talking to her about it, she said, well, who did you get to play Eve? This is the way she talked. And, um, I said, this is this young woman, this young girl, Journey Smollett. And she said, I know Journey. She said, she's a spooky little girl. I said, that's <laughs> the quality. That's the quality I'm looking for. I wanted a spooky little girl. Right. Yeah. And she, in the same, the, the, you're right. I mean, she, the, the film pivots on her performance, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. And she's astonishing. It's, yeah. it's very, very hard to find that kind of, that kind of performance. I mean, I, again, I, I, I haven't seen it for a long time. I watched it last week, and I said, hands down, it's probably one of the best written films I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen a lot of films. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, I think I think that the masterpiece of acting, uh, of writing and acting and performance, it really is. Uh, you could have mic dropped and gone and sung yourself on a on an, on an island. It would have all been very happy. But we're very happy you continued on through to Harriet. Okay, we're going to open out. So we've got some time for some questions from the audience. So we're going to open out. Uh, I started acting as a little kid. I got my first professional job when I was nine. Uh, I was in a children's theater and. Um, there was an audition for a role of a, on a local TV series, and um, and I got cast. So that my first my love of like the whole thing started when I was a little kid, and um, then I mean by the time I was I went to um, NYU to School of the Arts, and by the time I was like seventeen, I was in SAG and you know doing commercials and. Um, and by the time I was 21, I definitely had an American Express card and was self-supporting. And um, yeah, I started early, uh, is the answer. And um, and my career took a very kind of lots of twists and turns that I could not have predicted. Um, the most interesting thing I did for my acting career was um, I was I played a lot of cute people, right? You know, I had a very like baby face and curly hair, um, but in I think 1983, I, I crashed an audition, um, an equity audition, for uh, a Steppenwolf production of A Bomb in Gilead, which was an amazing theater piece directed by John Malkovich um, and starring all these amazing Steppenwolf actors. And um, in that, I played a, um, a drug crazed, violent lesbian. Um, you know, and 27 people are on stage. It's a very wild production, if you've ever. I mean, it's it's incredibly weird and wonderful play, and um, and that kind of changed the perception of me, and I became a cult actress, which was wonderful, and uh, and so then I got to do a bunch of horror movies and, and interesting stuff. So I did um, Vampire's Kiss and Candyman and Silence of the Lambs. And uh, so, and on and on. And then um, at that point, just before Silence of the Lambs, I had a lot of free time, like a lot of actors, uh, actresses especially, and black actresses especially, especially. Uh, I went to film school. And um, I thought, I was very interested in the image, you know, very interested in um, that language. And I went to film school to study cinematography. And um, came out of film school with a short film, that short film went on to festival, um, and Bill Cosby hired me as a writer, and I wrote a screenplay for him with two other uh, playwrights, with two playwrights, and that was like a wonderful education uh, in, in, in screenwriting or beginning to tell stories like that. And then um, eventually, uh, after Silence of the Lambs, I started ha being haunted by these stories about the Batiste, and eventually wrote *Use Bayou*, and then um, after not being able to find a director, decided I should direct it. So that's kind of the way it went down. I think we're, we're going to ha have to rest there. But for those of you whose appetite are absolutely whetted for this film, um, we can't stress enough what. It's not just that it's important, but it's it's cathartic. It's a cathartic film, I think. And uh, more importantly, I'd like to thank you, Casey, for. Um, not just these works, but the works you're going to make in the future and for 22 years being in the game. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.